morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the volunteers here at the Humble Patch Chapel. And as we always like to do, we like to begin our service with Scripture. Today's Scripture reading is Psalm 24. Psalm 24. In Psalm 24, King David writes this. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false, and who has not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of God of Jacob. Verse 7. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. The king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the king of glory will come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord of armies. He is the king of glory. Selah. Would you please rise with us as we sing our first hymn, hymn number 375 in your hymnals. Hymn number 375, Jesus Shall Reign. Let us sing. Well, welcome to our humble patch chapel here in Stuttgart. Uh, If this is your first time here, uh, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the volunteers here. Uh, We believe that we serve a God that is loving and warm and and open-handed. And and just from the moment you walked in the doors, we want you to feel the, the love. And what you can also hear in here is a lot of noise from kids. We love noisy kids because it means that our chapel is growing and that there's life. We don't want it to be quiet in here because that means it's not growing. There's not new life. So uh, there, you, don't, you don't have to remove kids from the service. Moms and dads just feel totally at home with kids wrestling around. We love the noise. Okay, uh, a few things for, for announcements. Um, this, is, this is Palm Sunday. One of the things I want to do every year is through the Passion Week, Jesus' last week on earth, I, I want to do this thing, and I've, I've tried to do it every year, but I've, I have failed miserably. But to walk through the week with Jesus is in his last week, in Passion Week, and to journal those seven days up until the cross. Um, it's something that I've, I've, I've wanted to do, so if you would like to do that, let's, let's get together and let's figure out how we can journal through that uh, this week. And then culminating in, we're going to have a service, an Easter sunrise service at Kelly. Um, it is... A tradition, right, Eric? It's a tradition that uh, military chaplains will wear their dress uniforms on Easter Sunday for the sunrise service. So if you want to, and it's put together, and you can join us in mess dress on Sunday morning. Some of you are going, no way. But either, either case, just dress warm. Last year it was pretty, pretty cold. Okay, um, we're having Easter lunch together as well. So after the service... The worship together continues, and we fellowship together. We encourage you to to join us today and next week as well. Also, to celebrate Easter, we have um, an excellent and art display. So everybody has been working on their art pieces. Doesn't matter what medium. It could be be, uh, digital. It could be fine art. It could be whatever you want. And today, you drop them off in the the fellowship hall. We're going to have them on display and then we're going to have them on display next week as well. Okay. Uh, Kate, Kate, anything to add on the, on the art piece? No? Okay, we add that. Third, we have a series of special services. Um, on Monday, Thursday, if you just look at your bulletin, on Monday, Thursday at, at uh, Robinson. And then we have there's a, a service with a potluck dinner afterwards. And then uh, Friday service, there will be no dinner, but it will be at 1800. And then again, the sunrise service at 
07 at Kelly. And if you know anything about Kelly, you got to get there early because there's parking is horrible. And the Bryans only have two parking spots at their house. So <laughs> just get there early. There's a big parking lot in front of the commissary. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, we did a series. Uh, one of the sermons that, that I was privileged to do a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, was on uh, the excellence of Jesus as the bondage breaker. And then the books just all disappeared because everybody took them, which is great. So if you need, if you would like a copy of this, we could just order more. But uh, there's, a, there's a few more, I think, of just the little books of this. But if this is something that, that after that series, if you want to go back online and listen to that, and this is something you think is for you, I, I want to sit down with you. Uh, Eric and I and, and uh, Kelly and, and Chris, we, we would love to sit down with you and see w- where, where some bondage needs to be broken in your life. Okay? So there's that. And then one, one other announcement I'm just throwing in here that uh, Eric doesn't know I'm going to announce, but uh, if you read the, the latest issue of the, stu- of the Citizen, okay, there's an article here. It says number 50 right there. Pastor Eric Chapman Bryan writes about uh, turning 50. It is the best article I've ever seen in this magazine. I'm serious. I'm serious. Everybody, there's a, there's a stack of these at the, at the uh, bus stop over there. Everybody, after the service, you can run and grab one, and he'll sign a copy. He's signing my copy. But seriously, this is probably the best article I've read in this magazine. And you know, I know it talks about turning 50, but it just talks about being present and how that part of us is being assaulted through, through phones and through... I'm not going to give away the, the, the whole thing. But anyways, it, it inspired me so much that, that, you know, I hope we all come to join one of these, these clubs right here. Little dump phone club. Okay. Um... And our other announcements, if you just look at the bulletin, we do this for several reasons. We give you this because we want to let you know what's going on in the life of our community all throughout the week. Our worship isn't just coming here on a Sunday and and sitting and listening to a sermon. It's actually life on life, right? Life change happens not through sermon on ears, but through life on life, meeting throughout the week and and our Thursday men's group at at Kelly. And there's a, there's a, a Wednesday group that meets here at the canteen here at Patch. Uh, the, the children's ministry is booming. Where's my buddy Grady? Right there. Club Beyond director right there. Grady's Club Beyond is booming. And over 50 kids here every Thursday right after school for the early out. And they got trips planned up. You guys going to Robinson? Not, not today. But they, they shoot each other with guns. Nerf, nerf guns. <laughs> they do all kinds. They blow marshmallows out of their noses. It's great. Okay. So youth ministry is booming. Um, the women's ministry is, is taken off. So you're part of that. Are we doing, are we doing prayer today? Okay, yes. Usually, because today is a special day, but usually the women get together in that corner, and they just pray. And then the, the men, we go and watch all the kids running around on the other side. Okay. Um, any, anything else? Any more announcements? We're so glad that you chose to spend your Sunday. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here with us, worshiping together and as we're growing together. So... With that, please stand as we sing hymn number 336. Hymn number 336, There is a Foundation. 336. Please be seated. And the next part of our our worship is uh, the hearing of God's word. Good morning. My name is Kate Porter, and I will be reading today's scripture. Our Old Testament reading comes from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. And our New Testament reading comes from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 1 through 11 can be found on page 672 in your pew Bibles. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim 
and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion will extend from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of your covenant, I will release your prisoners from the waterless cistern. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, can be found on pages 697 and 698 in your pew Bibles. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her foal. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that, was, so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and its foal. Then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. rise as we sing the doxology. As we transition now to our, our worship service where we hear the preaching of the word, I'm just going to spend uh, just a minute or two to pray. I'm going to pray for us. Um, did anybody do anything cool for, uh, for spring break? Were you going out of town? Yes. We went on vacation, and my friend has a new term for it. It's called a sanct sanctification, because there's so much sanctifying that needs to happen, and there's so much stress with trying to have a good time, but in the end, it just reminds us that God is always there saying, yeah, you still need me, even in your vacations, you need me so much. So I'm going to pray for us as we transition. We just, I want this time to be a time where we just get right before the Lord, before we, before we hear the teaching of his word. So we'll bring anything we have that's uh, pressing on our hearts, and we'll bring it to him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this moment to pause and to slow down our week, to reset, to get in the mindset of, of thinking about the Passion Week of Christ. His last week on earth where, where everything just slowed down where he'd spent time with with his disciples in the upper room and reshifted their focus, taught them to make things that matter most matter more. He taught them principles for for life in the church age. Lord, I I pray a a special blessing over um, Pastor Eric Bryant as he brings the word that he's labored over, that he's studied, that um, as he preaches the word, Lord, we thank you that your word will not return void. Lord, if there's anything on our hearts that need to be confessed to you, Lord, I I thank you that you uh, offer forgiveness from all unrighteousness simply by confession. So, Lord, now we we, uh, sanctify this time set apart to hear your teaching of the word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Each week I get a couple times to go meet the new people who are new to Stuttgart. 
Um, you know how you remember how that was, right? When you get to go to that newcomers briefing, and now we do in-person briefings, which we didn't do for a season. But you get to meet people, and you get to see, um, you know, the urgency as you try to find a home. And the housing briefing is always before the chaplain's briefing. And so you see the stress. You hear the like, am I going to live off post? Am I on post? Where am I going to live? And and I get a. I get to just have a few minutes with the new audience and remind them that, you know, as you're looking for a new home, you can also find a, a church home, a church family. And that's, and that's kind of why we do these, these gatherings on, on Easter morning early at 7 o'clock, you know, at meeting at Kelly Barracks in that, in that AFRICOM pray deck. And come if you can, because we're one voice in Stuttgart, and we get a chance to have one church family, chapel church family, however you want to call it, the body of Christ coming together from all different chapels it's kind of fun to see other, other believers gathering together on that pray deck. And so come if you can. And then at 11 o'clock, we meet here together. Um, again, it's a tradition of wearing our military uniforms, but it's not my preference. I don't like to wear it, but, but it is a special day. And I remember going to a church one time in, in Jamaica, and they always wear their best. They were very, very, very poor. They didn't have good shoes. I don't think a lot of them didn't wear shoes, but they wore their best. And that's why we wear our military uniforms on Sunday, that one specific Sunday. Because it just might be the most important day in human history. Seriously. Um, Join us for a potluck afterwards. Bring some homemade dishes if you can next Sunday for the Easter potluck. It's fun to just have a meal together. We have some out-of-town guests are coming in. Um, So just, just, just come be with us. And thank you for making this chapel your your chapel, your chapel home. If you ever get the opportunity sometime in your life, um, I hope you get to be part of a traditional Jewish Passover Seder. You know that traditional Passover Seder meal. Um, sometimes you make Christian adaptations of it, of the Passover meal, and those are wonderful, and it's a great use of your time. There's constant symbology through the food that you're eating. Um, there's, there's mixed um, mixed nuts with spices and honey that's kind of pasted together. And it reminds you as you're eating of that paste, the, the, the mortar bricks that were put together while the Jews were in slavery, and it's part of their history. The bitter herbs, the horseradish, you would not eat that normally, but you do in this case because it reminds you of the bitterness and the real suffering that still exists in many of God's people around the world. And unleavened bread, you know unleavened bread, there's no yeast in it. For Passover, they didn't have time to put yeast in it and let it rise. Um, the matzah crackers are probably best for, for moving, for people on the move. It's good to remember that that Passover meal was meant for people on the move. Like you and like me in some ways too. This military tribe we have, we're on the move. And Passover slows us down. It allows us to be grounded in things that are true. But it was on that Passover meal of this where the Lord Jesus first taught, as you know, about something new, about the bread and about the wine. He compared him to what would soon be his blood, his broken body on that cross. So today, as we always do on Sunday, the first Sunday of every month, we remember Jesus' blood, we remember his body, his broken body for us. But what was not typically, what still is not typically put on these modern Passover meals is what was experienced on that first Passover, which was the lamb's blood, right? And the lamb's blood that was put on the doorpost, the lentils of the house. From Exodus chapter 12, I remind you of this timeless word. When the Lord sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door, and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you, the plague that was on the Jewish firstborn, excuse me, the Egyptian firstborn, actually on all firstborn. But whoever's covered with the lamb's blood was allowed to be saved. So this morning, as we remember Jesus' blood, remember the context of which Jesus first celebrated that feast and what it meant Jesus, yes, he's the better Passover lamb. His covering, his blood still a covering, protection. 
His blood is the way of escape from death and a way out of slavery. So ushers, would you mind um, please coming forward as we, as we uh, celebrate communion together. And as the ushers come forward too, I want to remind you too, please remember this time is to be taken most reverently. If you don't quite know what the juice and what the bread means, let it pass over. Let it, let it pass by. Wait until you understand the significance of what it means. Think soberly about sin. Think about Jesus' great sacrifice for us. And your Father's relationship with you, which is restored, always on communion. And then as everyone is served, we'll partake together as one. If you read from the book of Matthew, Matthew was a Jewish man, and Matthew would have understood the Passover, I think, in ways that maybe the other gospel writers wouldn't have as much. So, definitely a Jewish man. He, and this is what Matthew wrote. He said, he said, as they were eating this Passover meal, Jesus took this bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. Let's break it together. He said, take Eat, this is my body broken for you. Matthew continues, he says, And Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it with you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many For the forgiveness of sins. Matthew picks up a line that's not recorded in the other Gospels where he says, I tell you, Jesus says, that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Isn't it an interesting thought to think that Jesus, the next time that he will partake of the fruit of this vine, he has promised he will drink it new with us. His people in his Father's kingdom. Jesus is the Passover land, a covering for our blood, freed us from the slavery of sin, and in the future, one day, we would drink this together with the Lord. What a beautiful thought. Over the past four or five years, um, I've found myself looking observing, more interested in this last week of Jesus' earthly life than I think I ever have in my whole life. Did a research project on it a few years ago, put it to some, some principles to my counseling work that I do, because the last week of Jesus' life, it's full of purpose, it's full of intentionality. It's, he's lived, he lives everything, he speaks everything with intensity and urgency. Everything that Jesus says and everything that does, he says, pay attention Pay attention and remember this. So let's just started paying attention. I don't know about you, but I've never been good at practicing Lent. This 40 days that we have between, you know, 40 days between um, Ash Wednesday and through, uh, through Easter, this discipline that we have, I wish I had it, I just don't. I admire the people who do. But one thing I have found very helpful for me and most meaningful is this last week of Jesus' earthly life. And I want the same for you. So today, I would like to help you think of how to best prepare for Easter. I hope it's something you'll remember in Easter weeks ahead. Something you might remember every Easter week here for the rest of your life. And as I have personally experienced, a way to personally connect and to know Jesus in deeper ways that I have never found before. I'll show you a summary of what I'd like to talk about today. Seven days. Palm Sunday, it's a day of welcome. Day, the second day of the week, which would be Monday, a day of cleansing. A third day, Tuesday, a day of learning. Fourth day, Wednesday, a day of open space. Thursday, a day of service. Good Friday as the sixth day, a day of having, finding peace with God. 
And seven days, the seventh day, Saturday, as it has always been, a day of rest. I really think it's possible for us to slow down this week, to think upon the things that actually happened in history on these days. Yes, they weren't the specific days, but they were events in history. And I'd like to just talk about this with you today. First day, a day of welcome. It's been a tradition in our church to celebrate today as Palm Sunday, as you know, the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem. And as you may have gathered in the back or been purchased when you were younger too, giving out palm leaves together. Palm leaves in the first century were waved to welcome warriors, heroes when they came back from battle after they returned back into the town. But the, part, but the heart of Palm Sunday is really not about the palm branches. It's the spirit and the attitude of the people who are there to welcome the king into their lives, welcome him into the city. And fulfilled on this specific day is a very important and messianic prophecy that came from Zechariah, one you won't find in any other prophetic books, but it gives very detail to the coming of the Messiah and the Savior that would come. And as you hear Kate read this important prophecy of the day, I'll read it again to you. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. Righteous and bringing salvation is he. He's humble. Mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah's prophecy, written between 450 years before Christ, but still the same spirit is with us today, 2,500 years later. The invitation is still the same. As you prepare for this week of Easter week, the first thing that we can do is opportunity to renew, to renew our welcome to the true king. Perhaps my life is like yours. Years ago, decades ago, I first welcomed the Lord into my life, probably eight or nine years old. As a teenager, I mean, I went through difficult things, making mistakes in my 20s and 30s, re-welcoming the Lord into my life. Even now, there are broken parts of my life that I'm not proud of, I don't get, I can't fix. But Palm Sunday is an opportunity for, for me and hopefully for you too to welcome the Lord back into your life in new and fresh ways to rekindle that childlike faith that you had as a child and maybe you've lost for the years, to think about the Lord again as being your first true lover, your first true bride. I know that for some of us here too, we're young, and we have to start somewhere. Perhaps Palm Sunday is a great, fantastic day for you to first welcome the Lord into your life. John chapter 1 writes this. Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But all who did receive him, welcome him, receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That is the promise of the enduring word of God. Welcoming the king to our lives. So Sunday, the first day of the week, may be a day of welcoming for you. Tuesday, or excuse me, Monday, Monday, the second day of the week, the day we now call Monday. It's a day of cleansing. If you find your home getting a little junky, if your room, in your mind, your life in a metaphorical sense, if it's a kind of a mess, If you feel cluttered in your life with just a lot of unnecessary junk, if your life needs spring cleaning, pay attention to this day. If you sense that your life is just not producing any fruit, just kind of stuck, you're going through the motions, it's not really producing any spiritual fruit, pay pay very close attention to the two events today. I think they go hand in hand together. The second day of this holy week. Mark's text, chapter 11, reads in this way. He says, On the following day, which is the following day after Jesus arrived, this would be Monday, Jesus came from Bethany and he was hungry. 
And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, no fruit. It was not the season for figs, he said. And he cursed this fig tree. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Such a puzzling interaction. The first thing that happens during the week, Jesus and his disciples, together in front of this this fruitless fig tree, here is the point, I think. God desires fruitfulness. He hungers for fruit. We see that through Jesus' example. Jesus is not impressed by showiness, by just leaves. And we, you, me, like trees, are designed to be fruitful people. Immediately after, Jesus goes into the temple, into Jerusalem. He goes directly to the heart of the temple in Jerusalem. And this is what we read in Mark chapter 11, verse 15. He reads, Jesus entered the temple. He began to drive out. And he sold those who bought in the temple. He overturned the tables with money changers. And the seats of those who were sold with pigeons, who sold pigeons. And teaching and saying to them, Jesus said, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Jerusalem's center, the temple, the heart of the city was not designed, was not working in the way it was designed to be. Like the fig tree, wasn't producing any fruit. The heart of the temple was cluttered filled with junk, full of self-profit, a house of profit, not a house of prayer. And this is, I think, what we learn from Jesus at this unique day of the week. We, just like the fig trees, are like fig trees. We're designed to produce fruit, but we cannot produce fruit if our lives and our temples are cluttered. Holy Week, this Monday, Make it a personal day of cleansing. Think about your temple. Think about your body, your life. What needs to be thrown out? What tables need to be flipped? If you want to be fruitful for the kingdom of God, spring cleaning, Monday. Day number three, Tuesday. A day of learning. On the third day of the week, um, the day we now call Tuesday, it's a day that we see some of Jesus' most passionate and urgent teaching. In fact, if you read through the gospel letters and just survey them, the pages are full, full of Jesus' urgent teaching, much of which is covered this second, this, excuse me, this third day of the week, Tuesday. And on Tuesday, Jesus returns to the temple, now that it's cleared out, now that it's ready for learning. And isn't it true to life? After we clean out what doesn't belong, then we replace it with something better. This is what Jesus does on this third day. This day is full of learning. Jesus returns to the fig tree to illustrate some powerful lessons on faith and in prayer. And then he goes right to the temple again. And he speaks about a parable about a vineyard owner who expected to find fruit. Again, you hear this theme of fruitfulness in the Lord. But these workers killed the owner's son, clearly foreshadowing Jesus' days to come. And then we hear Jesus answering some of the ageless questions that we still ask today. Should we pay taxes? Should we pay taxes to leaders who we don't like? Leaders who we don't agree with? It's funny how this happens every April when we read this. Jesus taught on marriage, and Jesus taught on law, And Jesus summarized the law in words you all know so so well. Love your Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. And love your neighbors as yourself. Again, Jesus teaching this day. Jesus here also taught about hypocrisy. He looked at people in their fancy clothing. He wanted to be noticed. He looked at people sitting in places of honor. He looked at people who have been praying long prayers to be noticed. He said, don't be like this. 
He looked at people who were being generous because they're giving out of their abundance. And he pointed out a woman, a widow, who gave very little monetarily, but she gave him all that she had. And Jesus said, that is what it means to be generous. Then the same day, this day, this Tuesday, the, the teaching gets more urgent. And because it is Jesus' last few days of his life, he speaks about some of the most serious and some of the most serious things to come. The end of all times, Jesus speaks about wars. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and famines. He likens that the end days will come when there will be birth pains. He said there will be false prophets who will perform signs and wonders. He said you will be, will be hated when you, when you align yourself to my name, the names of Jesus. You will even be aligned and hated even by family members in these last days. He says the heavens will be shaken Skies will be dark and the sun will be dark and stars will fall from heaven. And the Son of Man will come in clouds with great power. He will gather his elect, that's his words, not mine, from the four ends of the earth. And then the text ends and Mark with this way, urgent words, I think meant for us as well. He says, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. You do not know when the master of the house will come. But what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is Tuesday. This is Tuesday, a day of learning. And as you prepare for Easter week and Easter, just examine yourself. Are we still teachable? Do we still have a teachable heart? Are we learners in life? Yes, I know your life is like mine. It's full of books and podcasts and things to learn. There are plenty of sermons to learn online, much better than mine. There are Bible studies and groups on every base in Stuttgart. I know some of us are visual and kinesthetic learners. We learn by service and doing and acting. We probably learn by taking a Volksmarch with each other and walking and talking out our questions. Of course, time spent alone, quiet, with the Holy Spirit as your best teacher, make Tuesday a day of learning. May the day remind you to have a teachable heart to the Lord Jesus as you prepare for Easter. The fourth day, Wednesday, is a very interesting day. For some reason, as you read the scriptures, in this day we call Wednesday, it's very quite strange. You won't find a lot written about Wednesday. The scriptures are strangely silent. You'd think, like on one of the most important weeks of all time, you think there's about to be detail about this day. But Wednesday's silent. Wednesday is kind of left open. Why do you think the Lord designed it this way? I don't know, but I kind of like it. Because I don't think God wants our lives to be so jam-packed. Yes, there are seasons of busyness, but not habitually. There are times when we're extremely busy, yes, especially in our professions here, but I don't think they should be habitually busy. Open space, like a day of the week, allows us to refocus, allows us to think about priorities in a different way, allows us to play a little, to laugh a little, to get back to our childlike faith. And I think when we leave our times open, the most beautiful things happen spontaneously. Now, the scriptures aren't very clear about this. This could have happened on Wednesday, what I'm about to tell you. It also could have happened on a different day. It's just, it's hard to make certain in the scriptures, so I want to leave it open. But a lot of people do believe that on this second day before the Sabbath, which would be a Wednesday night, Jesus was reclining in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. From Mark chapter 14, I'll read you this beautiful story. While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at a table. 
a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, spike nard, very costly. In fact, so costly, we'll read that it costs 300 denarii, that's 300 days wages, that's a year's worth of work in this one alabaster flask. Put that in perspective, what's the average salary in Stuttgart? Over $100,000 right here. She took this alabaster flask, she broke it, and she poured it over Jesus' head. (laughs) Jody and I were talking about it last night. We were just thinking how, you know, if this did happen two days before the cross too, I mean, picture an ointment worth how much it's worth poured over your head. The fragrance would have been there for days. Just a beautiful thing to think about. Jesus on the cross, perhaps even still that fragrance of this offering on him, on his body. But they were indignant, some of them, and they were very practical. Why was this ointment wasted like that? For the ointment could have been sold for more than 300 nari and given to the poor, and so they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before my burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Still told today in Stuttgart, Germany, 2,000 years later. Sometimes, when you keep your life open, open space, the most spectacular things happen naturally. A quick recap, Sunday. First day of the week, a day of welcome. Day number two, Monday, a day of cleansing. Day number three, Tuesday, a day of learning, keeping a heart teachable. Day Wednesday, the fourth day, a day of open space. Day number five, Thursday. So many words you could use, but perhaps a day of service. Because if you had one last day to live in your life, one last dinner meal, one last interrupted conversation with those you love the most, what would you do? This is the excellence of Jesus, and this is what Jesus chooses to do. John chapter 13, Jesus arose from this beautiful last Passover supper. He laid down his outer garments. He took a towel. He tied it around his waist. He poured water in a basin. He approached his disciples, the people he loved the most. He got down on his feet and washed the disciples' feet. He wiped them with a towel that wrapped was around his waist. He said, you call me teacher and Lord. He said, you are right, for yes, I am. But if I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. But I ask you, Stuttgart friends, what does foot washing mean for us today? We don't walk around in sandals on dirty roads with dirty feet like they did back then. What does it mean to wash each other's feet today? I think it means to be a servant wherever, with whomever God has placed in your life, to do the lowly things Things nobody else wants to do. As I look around at this beautiful chapel family, I see so many good examples of service. There's one person in this chapel family who quietly takes out the trash from the fellowship meal next door after everyone's left. Someone goes to the commissary, picks up the sandwiches, picks up the 
the fruit and picks up the vegetables, does the hard work while everyone else is kind of getting ready for service. They come early. Someone stays late and counts the offering. Someone got some palm leaves today. They went out of the way when there weren't a lot of palm leaves left. They spent their time and their money doing some acts of service. Someone else walks up and down the aisles after everyone has left. Not a chaplain assistant, but one of you. Neatens up the Bibles, neatens up the hymnals, little acts of slowly service that nobody knows. Unappreciated. Another person, this is a hard one. <laughs> they sign on an elderly person who can't be signed on base, and they bring this person to service, and they take this elderly person who can't walk home. That is such an act of service. But it's not just in your chapel, it's in your home, yes? It's in your work. What roles in your home can you do, not just on Thursday, but a way of living, a way of life? This is the example of your Lord. My Lord, your Lord. Let it not just be a Thursday, but let it be a way of life. Day six. We call this day Good Friday. This coming Friday, I hope you can take time to soberly think about this day. Jesus on the cross, probably six hours from nine o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the afternoon, six hours of the day. Find a place where you can think about it. Maybe get together with someone, I don't know. Or just spend some time alone, maybe read through the gospel letters if you can. But if you have the time, and if you want an extra perspective of this story that you might not read before, from someone who wrote about it 700 years before it happened, not after it happened, but before what happened, I encourage you this Friday to read Isaiah chapter 53. Here are just some of Isaiah's words. He was despised. He was rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquity. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. By his wounds, we have been healed. There are so many words you can put to Good Friday, too many words to even do justice to the day. A day of sorrow, a day of rejection, a day of pierce, a day of being wounded, a day of grief, a day of being crushed. But it is a good Friday because this day and this act of work on the cross has brought us peace with God. If you have not yet found peace with God, if you haven't experienced God's complete forgiveness of your sins, past, present, and future, don't let Good Friday pass without giving it a thought. Consider the significant act of the Lamb of God on the cross. Chastisement brought on him, but has given us peace. This is what makes Good Friday good. Next week is Easter Sunday. We will celebrate the most significant day, I think, I think, in the most, in human history. But for some reason, we always skip over Saturday. Every day matters, and every day has purpose. In the back of your thoughts, don't miss the seventh day of the week. The seventh day has always been a day of rest. Always been a day of rest. Perhaps it's God's greatest gift to us, the human race. The word for Sabbath, Shabbat, 
It means to stop. It means to cease. It means to rest. But also means to stop your work and look back at the good work that you saw. Kind of like from creation. God rested on the seventh day. He was pleased with the work that was done. But he rested and he did something different. And he stopped. Sabbath, transparently I say, has always been so confusing for me as a Christian in this modern day age. I don't understand I mean, I do understand. I've read the different thoughts on it, but why don't we rest? Why are we so bad at resting these days? Is it an American problem? I don't know. School schedules, sports schedules, work schedules, military life, deployments. We don't work. We don't rest. It's, it's something so hard for us to do, and I don't quite get it. But what I do know is this. God rested on the seventh day. even in the tomb. And if God is rested, you have permission to rest as well. It just might be one of the greatest witnesses, witnessing opportunities for witness that we have in our generation by how we choose to rest. Seven days to Easter, a day of welcome, a day of cleansing, which leads to a day of learning, a day for open space, a day of quiet, a day to just let beautiful things happen, a day of service, and then Good Friday. So many different words to put there. Saturday, always has been a day of rest. This is the excellence of Jesus. His example to all of us to think about every Easter week. Let's conclude our time together in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, Father, we restore our relationship with you this week through Jesus. And I hope I speak for everyone here, every listening here. This Palm Sunday, we renew our welcome of you. Yes, you're already here. The king is here. You enter. You're sovereign, yes. But we welcome your presence. We receive you into our lives, into our cities. God, we need your help to clean out our temple, our cluttered mess. Help us. Convict us. We need your help again with a teachable mind. For those of us, myself included, stuck and stubborn in my ways, give me a teachable heart. Give all of us a teachable heart to you. God, give us courage to leave open space in our life for beautiful moments to happen. Remind us of your example of service, even in our work, our families, our church. Doing things seeing things that nobody else wants to do. And God, Friday's cross, words cannot come close to expressing what this day means to our, our praise for you. We don't understand, understand the significance of everything that happened, but we do see Jesus' fierce obedience, and we are in complete awe to all that he endured. Father, in all that we ask to do in our attempts at service this week, our time set rests. May this week be characterized by the word Hosanna. Hosanna, like our kids saying today. Help us. Save us. Lord, help us and save us. That's what Hosanna means today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's, uh, let's stand and sing. We have one more closing uh, hymn to sing. Hymn number 370. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Chapel family here. Help us be a body that grows continuously towards you and loves each other well, sacrificially in your example. In Jesus' name we pray.